This video continues the discussion of descriptive measurements that can summarize numeric data. We previously talked about central tendency, and now we're going to talk about measures that can describe the dispersion or the variability of measurements within a sample. So statistical samples contain many individual observations or measurements, and so therefore it's important to have some kind of value that can summarize the characteristics of that complex data set. We learned in the previous video about measures of central te tendency and average, and this video introduces measures of dispersion or variability in the values of, of data or samples. We'll move on to statistical hypothesis testing of those measures later on. So dispersion is just a technical term for variability, describing how spread out the data points are around the center of the data, with the center usually being measured by the mean. The simplest way to measure dispersion is just to calculate the distance from each point to the mean. So you just subtract the mean from every point. However, there's a problem with this. Because points smaller than the mean will have a negative dis difference, and points larger than the mean will have a positive difference, they're going to tend to cancel each other out. It's not a great measure of dispersion then. So what we do is instead of just using the actual distance, we use the squared distance from every point to the mean. So you subtract the mean from every point and then square that number. And this will convert those negative distances into positive numbers. These are, th these are then summed up or all added together to give a measure called the sum of squares. So it's the sum of the squared distances from each point to the mean. This is an extremely uh, widespread and important way of measuring dispersion, um, around the mean at least, and it'll come back again, we'll see it later on. But as a short aside, you might be wondering why the values are squared. Why don't we just use the absolute value of the distances? It's partly convention, but the sum of squares does have some mathematical benefits. Um, for example, it's mathematically easier to find a value that minimizes the sum of squares rather than finding the minimum of the absolute value. You know, there's other things as well, but that's sort of one of the reasons. But the sum of squares on its own isn't used to quantify dispersion that often because its magnitude varies with sample size. You might imagine the sum of squares for a thousand data points, so you're adding up a thousand numbers, is almost certainly going to be larger than the sum of squares for just ten data points. You add together ten distances. So dispersion is instead measured often as something called variance. So the sample variance is just given the symbol S squared. Variance is the sum of squares that we saw on the previous slide divided by N minus 1, where N is the sample size, the number of measurements in your sample, the number of observations, for example. So why N minus 1? Um, why can't we divide just by N? Why don't we just divide by the sample size? Uh, well, this is related to something called the degrees of freedom. And that might be easiest to illustrate with an example. So let's consider this small sample here of five observations. You know the first values are four, six, six, and four. And so what could the fifth value be? Well, it could be anything. I mean, it could probably be something like four or six if you're extrapolating, but it could be 4.5, 4.67, it could be 15. We don't even know what it is. There's no constraints on that fifth value. It could be anything at all. But now imagine the same data set, four, six, six, and four, but now we know that the mean of the sample, x bar, is 5. So if the first four values are 4, 6, 6, and 4, the fifth value must be 5. If the mean is 5, the fifth value can only be 5. So in that case, if we know n minus 1 values and the mean, the final value has no freedom to vary. So we have four degrees of freedom in this example. We're essentially using one of them to calculate our sample mean in the equation for variance. So basically, we n, n minus 1 is often used in these things where one of the degrees of freedom is used to calculate the, the mean. So this gives us what's called the unbiased sample variance. The n minus 1 is the unbiased estimator, as opposed to, the, as opposed to just using n. So sample variance is calculated as the sum of squares divided by n minus 1 because we have n minus 1 degrees of freedom, having used one of them to estimate the sample mean from the data itself. So the sample variance s squared is 
used as an unbiased estimate of the population variance, which is given sigma squared. And so unbiased just means that there isn't a tendency for it to be either low or high. It doesn't mean that it's really precise, but it means that it's not going to be typically lower or typically higher. It could be lower, it could be higher, but we don't really know. So because the sum of squares, um, because we're using the sum of squares, variance is measured in the original unit squared. So if we're measuring the, the, the grain size of sand grains, our variance will be in millimeters squared, for example. That's kind of an awkward unit to use. And so for that reason, if we want to describe the dispersion when we're writing a sentence or in a table in a paper, it's more common to report the standard deviation S. The, the sample standard deviation is S, so it's just the square root of the sample variance. And this has the same units as the original data. If our data are sizes, our standard deviation will be in millimeters or whatever unit we measured. So remember in statistics, we're using a small, hopefully representative sample to estimate characteristics of this large population. And so the sample standard deviation S is going to be an estimate of the population standard deviation, which is given as sigma. So variance and standard deviation are quite commonly used to compare um, dispersion between samples but there is one potential complication that comes up at least in some cases. Um, because these deviations are measured from the mean, um, the magnitude of those deviations and therefore the size of the variance or the size of the standard deviation will tend to be larger when the mean is low. So variance has some relationship to mean and that can be a problem and in certainly in, in certain cases which I'll illustrate next. So we can avoid that problem. We can avoid the fact that the variance has some relation to the mean by calculating something called the coefficient of variation, which is just the standard deviation S, our sample standard deviation, divided by our sample mean X bar. So again, remember that we're always using a sample to estimate parameters of this larger population. So our sample coefficient of variation, CV with a little hat on it, is an estimate of the population coefficient of variation. You don't really see coefficient of variation that often because it's only useful in very specific circumstances, um, but it can be useful for comparing dispersion if the two measurements have very different units or if their means are very different. Remember that variance has some relation to the mean itself. It's important to note that just because the means are different, you don't necessarily want to use coefficient of variation. You really want to use it if that difference in means is actually important, as opposed to just being sort of random noise in your data. So it's important to note that the coefficient of variation is only meaningful if all of your measurements are positive numbers. If you have some negative numbers, it's not going to make any sense. And you also should be warned that the calculated number is going to be quite sensitive to changes in the data if the mean is close to zero. Because we're dividing by the sample mean, if that's a very small number, small changes, the mean goes from you know, 0 0.001 to 0 0.002, your coefficient of variation will change a lot, even for very tiny differences in the mean. So you may still be wondering, when should I use the coefficient of variation? Well, here's an example. Let's say we want to know whether earthquakes, like large earthquakes, occur more regularly in Japan or in Cascadia, the subduction zone along Western North America. So we want to know, you know, is the time between earthquakes more regular in Japan or in North America? So I've just made up some numbers here, and it tells you that the, the mean time between earthquakes in Japan is 100 years, and, you know, and it's 400 years in Cascadia. Uh, the standard deviation of the time between earthquakes is 20 years in Japan and 40 years in, in North America in this made up data set here. So if we just looked at standard deviation, we'd say that, well, Japan is much more regular. The earthquake timing, the st time between earthquakes is much more, more regular than it is in North America because the standard deviation is only 20 years and not 40 years. But if we calculate the coefficient of variation, standard deviation divided by mean, we find that Japan is 0 0.2, 20 divided by 100, and Cascadia is 0.1. So we'd actually make the opposite conclusion. 
that the earthquake timing is actually more variable in Japan than time between earthquakes. So this is an example where the mean differs and we might want to use coefficient of variation. You've got to be a little careful sometimes. More commonly you want to use coefficient of variation when you are comparing things measured in different units. So for example, if you want to know is pH more variable than temperature or is temperature more variable than pH if we measure it in a bunch of different lengths. Those are measured in different units. Temperature is in degrees Celsius, pH is in pH units. And so therefore, it really wouldn't make sense to compare the actual raw standard deviations, which are measured in degrees Celsius or pH units. If we divide by the mean, we are dividing degrees Celsius by degrees Celsius, and so we get a non-dimensional measure of comparing variability. So R has built-in functions to calculate both variance, VAR, and standard deviation, FD. Like the mean and median functions from the previous video, these both require a single numeric vector, a single set of numbers as the input. Uh, like I mentioned with the mean, these both treat NA values, missing data, um, as, as NA. And so you'll run into this problem where if there is missing values, the result of the function will also be NA. So you might want to remove those NA values using this NA.RM equals true option that's built into either function. So I don't know of a built-in function to do coefficient of variation in the base version of R at least, but it's not really necessary. It's just standard deviations divided by mean. You know both those functions, so you can calculate it pretty easily. So the output of this and any functions can be display will be displayed to the screen if you just type this, or you can assign it and store it as a variable.